my name is Sam Testain. I'm a spacecraft firm engineer based at STFC Rail Space. I'm going to Sweet. talk about a project that we've worked on here at Rail Space, uh, which is one of the, the instruments for the James Webb Space Telescope. Now, first of all, what is JWST? Um, the James Webb Space Telescope, or JWST, is really the NASA successor to the, the Hubble Space Telescope. I'm sure you're all aware of the Hubble Space Telescope and all of the incredible images that that, that telescope has been sending us to sending to us here on Earth over the last 30 years or so. And James Webb really is the long-term successor to Hubble. Um, it's a large infrared optimized space telescope, um, which is named, you, know, you probably wonder who James Webb is, He's a former NASA administrator um, during the 60s, who was the administrator during the Apollo era. Um, and um, it's a mission that's led by NASA with significant contributions from space agencies in both uh, Europe and Canada. Um, now, in, in terms of the launch, it was actually scheduled um, to launch in March of next year on uh, an Ariane rocket from French Guyana. Um, however, it's now been um, delayed due to the, the coronavirus pandemic. Obviously, everyone having to more or less halt work on it over the last few months. Um, so a new launch date is due to be announced. It will likely, I would expect, be later in 2021 or, or early 2022. Um, yeah, when, when it launches, it's going to be quite a significant moment. To give you an idea of scale, um, I mean, we can see a, an image um, or a, a model of James Webb here in this image. So this is actually outside um, the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center um, near Washington, D.C. in the States. Uh, to give you a sense of scale, you can see just a, a, a guy kind of walking past it there in terms of the size of it. Um, it's not just the size as well, it's, it's the cost of it. Um, in the uh, delays of the launch over the years is pushing the, the cost of a mission now to something close to the $10 billion mark. So significant cost um, to this space mission. And I, I would argue it's one of the most ambitious space projects that's ever been launched. To give you a further sense of scale, um, we've got a comparison here of James Webb um, alongside a tennis court. So you can see it's slightly shorter than a tennis court, slightly wider than a tennis court. So this is the size of, of what we're sending into space and really gives you a sense of the, the scale of the engineering achievement that, um, that there'll be when, when this finally launches. What are the science objectives? Well, there are four main science themes. Um, first light, the assembly of galaxies, planetary systems, uh, and the origin of life, and birth of stars and planetary systems. So to address these themes, what James Webb is going to have to do is observe incredibly faint systems from, uh, sorry, incredibly faint signals from incredibly distant stars and, and galaxies in the furthest reaches of the universe um, that we've not really been able to observe before because we've not had the technology. And, for us to do this, it therefore has to have a very large mirror to gather as much light as possible um, in order to, to read these signals. And it has to have very cold instruments. Um, the reason it has to have very cold instruments is um, JWST is designed to operate in the infrared regime of, of light um, with incredibly faint signals. And of course, infrared is something that everything is emitting. Um, we ourselves at this moment are emitting an infrared. If you think of an infrared camera, you point an infrared camera at something, it's going to pick up an infrared signal. So what we have to ensure is that the incredibly faint infrared signals that the JWST is picking up is not going to be drowned out by the infrared being emitted by the instruments themselves and the spacecraft themselves. It's all about reduce, uh, reducing the amount of noise in the signal so that we can pick up, um, pick up the, the really faint stars that we're trying to observe. And, and answer these, these really big scientific questions. How is JWST different, uh, different to Hubble and how is it better than Hubble, I guess? Well, I mean, first of all, I guess the key point to make is, as we can see in this image here, JWST is slightly different in some ways um, in terms of its science objectives because it's based in the infrared with Hubble predominantly based in the kind of visible regime. But really the other big thing is the, um, the, the size of the mirror. I mean, we can see in this image here, we've got the Hubble primary mirror, which is about two and a half meters in diameter, 2.4 meters in diameter, I believe, um, in terms of its size. And we have the, the JWST primary mirror, 
which instead is about six and a half um, meters in size. So by far the, the largest um, mirror that we'll have ever sent into space. And this is all about gathering as much light as possible um, and allowing us to make these readings. The other big difference between the two is, as we can see in this image, Hubble is, is based in an Earth orbit, um, a, a low Earth orbit in order to, to operate. Um, in contrast to that, the James Webb Space Teles Telescope is going to move to the L2 Lagrange point. Now, a Lagrange point um, is always a, a kind of difficult one to explain, and I'm not convinced I fully understand it myself, but it's essentially a region of space where the gravitational potential of the Earth cancels out with the gravitational potential of the Sun. So the spacecraft is more or less able to hover in this space with its, um, its, its kind of uh, the influence of the Earth and the influence of the Sun canceling each other out. And the main reason that we would do this is uh, really the stability of it. Unlike Hubble, which is orbiting around an Earth, which is a, an incredibly variable thermal environment, as, as we discussed earlier, Webb is actually in a very stable thermal environment. It doesn't have these varying environmental heat fluxes. And what that therefore means is that we can actually operate the, the telescope and the observatory in a much more stable way. Okay, so what I've actually, I mean, I guess the question that probably a lot of you are, are asking now is how on earth do we get something so big um, into orbit? And what this video here is going to do, hopefully this is working for everyone. Um, yep, okay, looking good. Um, so yeah, the, the spacecraft itself um, is shipped on the Ariane 5 rocket in a, in a deployed form. And then as it starts transitioning to the L2, the branch point, it then starts to gradually deploy. So we just saw the solar array coming out here. What we're seeing here is the, hum, uh, the heat shield deploying. Now the heat shield is designed to, to shield the entirety of the, um, the cryogenic observatory from the sun to first of all get it as cold as possible. Um, what we can see here is that the heat shield gradually deploying and uh, the first thing you'll notice is of course it's shiny. We want to reflect as much of that sunlight away. We want to limit what is then going to radiate to our observatory up here. Um, so yep, this is the, the heat shield having now just fully extended. And now there are different stages of the heat shield that are going to separate from each other. Again, similar to MLI, we're creating a series of radiative barriers that the heat has to radiate through before it gets sent. Now the, the mirror itself is deploying. So this thing here is the secondary mirror. And this is the primary mirror here, which is gradually folding into place. Um, gold coated so that we can reflect as much light as possible into the telescope um, and, and use that light for the science. Um, I should add as well that the mirror itself um, is an incredible engineering achievement. Each of these mirrors has its own motor actuator on the back, which allows JWST to focus the mirror um, during the mission. And um, the uh, mirrors themselves are made out of beryllium, uh, coated in an incredibly fine layer of gold. Um, gold, again, to gather as much, uh, as much light as possible, to be as reflective as possible. So hopefully that's conveyed just how much of an engineering challenge it's been um, putting such a large spacecraft into orbit and, and getting it to deploy in a way that's going to work. And um, when this actually happens and all of this hopefully um, is achieved successfully, it's going to be a really big accomplishment for the team that's worked on it. Okay. So Let's talk a little bit more about the science instruments. Um, so there are four instruments mounted to the rear of the telescope. Um, we can see here um, an image. So this is the, the heat shield that I mentioned. Um, this is the mirror on this side. And at the back of the mirror, we have a, an instrument module which contains each of these four instruments, near cam, near spec, uh, FGS, which is the fine guidance system, and MIRI, the mid-infrared instrument. Um, near cam, near spec, and FGS are all optimized for working in the near infrared. MIRI is optimized in the mid infrared. So these are different regimes of, of infrared light, each of which uh, corresponds to a different area of scientific interest. Now, as I said, all of these instruments have to be incredibly cold. Um, so what that means is that 
this instrument module here is actually cooled to something like minus 230 degrees Celsius, incredibly cold temperatures. And this is all achieved using this sunshield and using the, the coupling that radiative coupling that this observatory has out to deep space. Now, of course, remember what we said, actually the majority of, of spacecraft equipment has to be kept warm. So all of the critical components for things like communications, uh, things like power generation, uh, software, attitude control, you know, how we orient the spacecraft is all housed within the spacecraft bus. Um, and this has to be operated at room temperature. So, so we actually have a significant thermal gradient from this room temperature part of the observatory all the way through into this cryogenic part. Um, okay, let's talk a bit more about MIRI. So MIRI is what we at RAL Space worked on. Um, it's both a camera and a spectrograph. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with what a spectrograph is, it's something that can essentially identify what a material is based on the wavelengths of light that they emit. And as I said, MIRI is designed to observe in the mid-infrared region of the electromagnetic spectrum. Now, we at RAL Space um, are responsible for the, th the thermal design of MIRI, um, and we were also previously responsible for building and testing MIRI um, when it was still at RAL. Now, the thermal challenges are incredibly significant. So um, MIRI actually is the coldest part of JWST. Its detectors are cooled to minus 267 degrees Celsius, so only six degrees above absolute zero. Incredibly difficult thermal challenge. And um, we, we built uh, MIRI about 10 years ago now, and it was delivered to, to NASA Goddard in 2012. So you can see, since delivering it, there's been a, a long process up until now where it's been integrated into the spacecraft and we're awaiting launch. This is something I'll, I'll talk a bit more about later on. How do we get it so cold? Um, as I said, MIRI is already pre-cooled. Um, it sits in that instrument module that already cools it to minus 230 degrees. What the design focuses on um, is insulating it as, as well as possible. So this is done using um, multi-layer insulation, which we can see mounted to the exterior um, of, of MIRI and using carbon fiber. So carbon fiber is designed to have low thermal conductivity struts. And the other key thing is that MIRI is designed to consume as, as little power as possible. The more power that MIRI consumes, uh, the more difficult it's going to be to achieve those cold temperatures. The last thing is active cooling. So this is an instance where active cooling is essential. There's a cryogenic cooler system that routes into MIRI from the underside here that provides specific cooling to the detectors. Um, so the cryogenic cooler is essentially like a fancy fridge, um, a really high tech fridge that is continuously removing heat from the system in order to get these temperatures. So this is the way it works. But of course, we had to test it. Um, as I said, we did the assembly integration testing of MIRI um, at RAL, as, as well as the ground calibration, uh, which is what we can see in this image here. Um, is you can actually see a little bit more of MIRI without the MLI on in this image. So these are the, the carbon fiber struts that I mentioned here, which are designed to conduct as little heat as possible to, to isolate MIRI from, from the warmer surroundings. Um, and for us to test it, we had to simulate all aspects of the mission. So the thermal environment, the mechanical environment, uh, really thinking about things like launch for that, uh, and the optical environment, making sure that the optics are going to work when everything is that cold. And um, this required us to construct a, a dedicated cryogenic test facility um, at RAL space within our facilities to, to simulate the thermal environments. So this, this was essentially simulating the, the minus 230 degrees Celsius enclosure that MIRI is going to sit in during the mission itself. Um, so yeah, I mentioned we delivered this a long time ago, 2012. Um, what actually happened to it after we delivered it? Well, we can see a, a variety of images here. We, we delivered MIRI to NASA Goddard um, on the east coast of the United States. What we can see here is MIRI um, being lifted into um, into the, the integrated, uh, sorry, the instrument module, I should call it, uh, which houses the remainder of the instrument. This is a kind of more closer shot of that there. And we can see here, so this was all done sequentially. Instrument goes into instrument module. Instrument module 
goes into the back of the telescope here. And then this was the final telescope here. Again, you can get a real sense of the, um, the scale of, of this incredible mirror, this incredible piece of engineering technology, just by looking at the surroundings and the, the technicians stood around it. And what's the latest? Um, well, since 2012, we're still involved. Um, I'm one of the firm engineers working on MIRI still. Um, we're still involved in, in spacecraft level testing uh, in the USA, and we're still conducting a lot of analysis to try and understand what's going to happen in the flight. Um, the spacecraft now is actually fully assembled. So as of, I think it was August last year, the spacecraft is fully assembled. So this telescope element here was mounted um, to the actual spacecraft bus element of it. And everything is in the process, or was in the process of being tested. What we can see here is an image of the, uh, the telescope being moved into the, uh, the NASA thermal vacuum chamber that they've got at Johnson Space Center, which happens to actually be the same uh, test chamber that was used during the Apollo missions. So yeah, the, the largest um, space test chamber in the world. Um, and what we're really doing now is just rehearsing what's going to happen when we launch. So when we launch, there's going to be a process of something like two or three months when all of this deployment is going to happen of JWST and the MIRI is going to start to gradually cool down to the cryogenic temperatures. Um, and yeah, as I said, it's due to launch next year um, and it's going to be a really exciting moment. I'd encourage everyone who um, is interested in this stuff to just Google James Webb Space Telescope and, and learn more about the mission. I think it's going to be uh, really exciting when it launches next year and there's going to be a lot of incredible science that um, I hope is going to revolutionize how we understand our universe.